Good morning. This summer, Pacifica students had the opportunity to read some of C.S. Lewis's works. The books selected for my class were Paralandra and Till We Have Faces. Most students began summer with this daunting reading requirement lying ahead of them, and it only brought more and more terror as the first day of school came closer. But these novels, though somewhat confusing, were fascinating stories. On August 25th, we arrived to the campus where all of our wonderful teachers eagerly waited to greet us. Little did we know that these teachers had some of the best class discussions in store for us, even during our first week of school. The first novel, Paralandra, describes the story of creation on the planet Venus and reveals how its life strives to resist the evil one's temptation on the planet. Throughout Paralandra, there are many correlations to Genesis, the first book of the Bible. During class, we discuss some of the characteristics of Weston, a human from Earth who becomes engulfed by Satan while on Paralandra, and also the specific temptations the enemy used to get the Eve figure, Tinadrel, to sin. We asked questions and pondered how the Earth's representative Ransom was sent to save Paralandra, similarly to how Jesus was sent to save Earth, and also asked about the curiosity of both Adam and Eve, Tor and Tinadrill, and all of humankind in itself. Through this novel, Lewis pondered the thought of life on other planets and how Christians from Earth could possibly be sent to help those others. The class discussions on Paralandra brought to life the text and made the book more intriguing and fascinating than just another summer reading project. Our second book, Till We Have Faces, was quite different from Paralandra, revealing the story of a woman named Arul and the love she has for her goddess-like sister, Psyche. Questions such as, do we always believe what we see? Does Arul really love Psyche? And can jealous love even be considered love? Were called to our attention in our discussions of this book. The theme of a rule's love for Psyche traveled through the classroom as we tried to define the somewhat zealous love she portrayed throughout the book. This novel was also brought to life through theories and compelling comments between the teacher and students. At Pacifica, the faculty's ultimate goal is to teach students how to think and live well. One of the ways this happens is through our class discussions. Oftentimes, students are taught to memorize lessons so they may be able to perform well on the next test. Pacifica asks students to bring forth their own ideas and beliefs about the world. We learn through our peers and teachers in a way that helps us remember and ponder information we learn inside and outside of the classroom. The more we are able to understand and have the opportunity to ask questions on various subjects, the stronger the possibility will be for us to go beyond our normal thinking level, and furthermore, enable us to connect what we learn in the classroom to our daily lives. As for living well, the perfect demonstration would be our Thousand Pine Retreat, which we experienced two weeks ago. After separating into four teams to play a plethora of games, we each set off to win. Though it was cold and raining the first day, we joined our faculty in some amazing living as the students played fun games in their teams inside and an intense game of paintball in the rain outside. But the moment none of the students will ever forget was skit night. Our teachers and administrators gave us the most unique and wonderful performance I have ever seen. Through watching many astonishing humorous skits on an outside stage under the stars, we laughed and lived well that night. Though exhausted from the trip, I found it sorrowful to leave the moments we shared together and the beautiful mountains in Crestland, California. Living and thinking well definitely applies to the English class, where we have begun the Odyssey by Homer. We are learning how Greek ideals and gods reveal a world of desoi logoi, or of internal struggle and ambiguity in a person's life. 
One day, the question of whether humanity was monotropos or polytropos made it almost impossible to leave the classroom because of the amazing discussion that was taking place. Just last week, we created pictures to represent the incredible adventures of Odysseus. With laughter and joy, we were able to gain a better understanding of Odysseus's complicated journeys and that the novel often goes back in time to go forward. Through literature, and more importantly, my teacher, I have learned so much and enjoyed every moment of it. His enthusiasm for teaching and having a relationship with his students goes off this page, literally. His kind, wise, and eloquent words are a blessing to me and my fellow students each and every day. I am so proud and honored to welcome him to the stage today, Reverend Hayden Butler. supposed to change? Okay. Ah, perfect. Well, good morning. It's so exciting to see so many different types of people gathered for an event like this. Um, some experience of uh, conferences of an academic nature in the past have uh, didn't do, do something to, uh, to, not, to cause one not to hope as much that this many people will show up uh, or that this friendly of a crowd will, will show up. So to express some of my experience of our, uh, our symposium so far, it's really uh, intriguing to me how a person like C.S. Lewis can draw together such, uh, such different groups of people. We have high school students in here. We have uh, members of my church and many churches here, family members, people old and young alike. Uh, it's not often you get an author that can draw that kind of a crowd to think about that. That's one of the things I want to talk about today. So before I begin, I'd like to say a few thank yous. Thank you to Emma, first of all, for that, that wonderful introduction and uh, for her words. Uh, thank you to everyone who's sharing and beginning this, you know, this series of the great conversation. Uh, to my staff and fellow faculty, it's a, it's a privilege to work with you and to work with you in this way. And I, lastly, I'd like to thank our fellow, my fellow speakers for the symposium. Um, it's, you have, to, you have to respect that it's, it's, a, it's a strange experience uh, being able to meet the people that you've read before uh, and uh, being able to meet people whose words and work on Lewis and other, other topics have, have formed you uh, so much. Uh, meeting someone in their words is different, of course, than meeting someone in person. Uh, it's, a, it's a strange and wonderful experience. And so uh, as I've had that experience here, uh, I'd like to reflect upon that in the words of C.S. Lewis today. So, conversation is one of those mysterious things in the world. Defining it is difficult because it seems determined always to surprise us as soon as we believe we've figured it out. Conversations can arise between intimate friends, between lovers, but also between total strangers. Conversations can be found among the children and among the aged, the educated and the uneducated alike. Rich or poor does not matter. Through conversation, we are drawn out of ourselves and into something bigger than ourselves. And it is through this experience that we are changed. Conversation is powerful because it opens up new possibilities for how we think and live. If found in so many corners of human life, what then are we to say this thing called conversation is? And that is the question we're here to explore today. For C.S. Lewis, conversation engages our notions of what it means to teach and to learn humanly. And so we'll explore what he has to say on these matters in the works Our English Syllabus on the Reading of Old Books and, mere, and beyond personality. After sitting under Lewis's teaching, I'll propose these three ideas. First, that education and Christianity are partners and not enemies. Second, that education is by persons, with persons, and for persons. And third, that real education always engages in a genuine conversation. 
At the outset of our English syllabus, which is a lecture given to incoming freshmen about what they're going to be reading and why they're going to be reading it, Lewis remarks that, quote, one of the most dangerous errors instilled into us by 19th century progressive optimism is the idea that civilization is automatically bound to increase and spread, end quote. Quite to the contrary, quote, civilization is a rarity, attained with difficulty and easily lost, end quote. In order to get to the heart of this statement, we need a few definitions. Human beings, as they emerge in this lecture, are the bearers, the carriers of this thing called civilization through time and space. They're embodied creatures possessed of intellect, sentiment, appetites, and imagination. Virtue is the habit of excellence in these human capabilities, the activity of a well-ordered soul. Society is the collective activity and coexistence of such human beings. And civilization, after this, is the preservation and advancement of this excellent community over time. The well-ordered human being, the well-formed soul, is seen in this light crucial to the health of civilization. Lewis's sobering acknowledgement of the ever-advancing or retreating nature of civilization gives way to his introduction of education as the activity through which the ordering of the individual and society comes about. Lewis's use of the term education draws on the etymology of the word. Education is a drawing out of the potential of human nature into full expression. In short, education makes fully capable humans. In turn, these humans safeguard civilization. Alongside education, though, stand three other concepts central to Lewis's main idea in this lecture. These are training, schooling, and learning. Training, as it's used here, is the activity of preparing a person for work within a particular occupation. Lewis says, quote, our ideal must be to find time for both education and training. Yet our danger is that well, the danger is training for all and education for none. He then describes what he sees as a shift in university education, from forming students as proficient and fully capable human beings, capable of advancing civilization, to training them to merely operate in technical skills needed to perform an occupational task. And for him, that covers everything from welding and carpentry to law and medicine. We have the means of human society. We don't have the why of human society. We don't have the, the soul that, that gives it meaning. Moreover, the trading for one of one for the other can actually work against civilization because we've lost the framework within which vocational skill has found its place. Lewis then introduces a second related term, what he calls schooling. This is preparation for education, the formation of a person so that they can launch onto this quest of edu becoming educated. Schooling is the activity that teachers perform upon students prior to their university education. It's more, uh, it's more of a, a process that they undergo. Lewis puts it this way, quote, the university student is essentially a different person from the school pupil. He's not a candidate for humanity. He is, in theory, already human. He's not a patient, nor is his tutor an operator who is doing something to him. The student is, or ought to be, a young man who is already beginning to follow learning for its own sake, and who attaches himself to an older student, not precisely to be taught, but to pick up what he can." End quote. Schooling grants to the student the skills necessary, in other words, to self-teach and more importantly, a curiosity for exploring knowledge with other learners as a good in itself. Lewis elaborates further, quote, the schoolmaster must think about the pupil, 
Everything, he says, is to improve the boy's character or open his mind. The schoolmaster is there to make the pupil a good man. And the pupil must think about the master. Obedience is one of the virtues he has come to him to learn. His motive for reading one book and neglecting another must constantly be that he was told to, end quote. And here we see that schooling employs discipline in order to liberate the student. The learner moves from subordinate to something like peer. Through schooling, the student develops the will and desire to pursue knowledge and to engage their intellect in this rigorous quest on its own terms. Lewis then introduces a third term, what he calls learning. He puts it this way, quote, Learning is not education, but it can be used educationally by those who do not propose to pursue learning all their lives, end quote. Learning involves acquiring knowledge first through the disciplines of schooling and then through the quest of education. Lewis continues, quote, though you may have come here only to be educated, you will never receive that precious educational gift which a university has to give you unless you can at least pretend so long as you are with us that you were concerned not with education but with knowledge for its own sake, end quote. In this university context, learning is the activity of those pursuing knowledge for itself. What Lewis is cautioning against seems to be the regard for education as an object or a commodity to be pursued. It's something like uh, the person who attends a university merely for the diploma on the wall. This suggests someone can set about receiving the outward sign of an education without having been formed through learning. Put even more briefly, degrees do not necessarily indicate a person is educated. But if education is our goal, the drawing out into full expression of those things appropriate for human beings must be paramount to us. With all of Lewis's terms in place from this essay, the whole pattern of education goes something like this. The student begins to pursue learning through a discipline of schooling in order to arrive at the opportunity to seek education for its own sake. This opportunity is pursued in a community of professional learners so that the student comes to look on what is true through the lens of a particular subject. The hope is that formation of a well-ordered human being through their experience of reality, of the real world, of seeing it and looking upon it for themselves as it is. Once formed, one may then pursue a training for a vocation, but only after having become formed by putting on their proper humanity. We now move forward to On the Reading of Old Books, an essay set as a preface to an edition of On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. Lewis begins by observing, quote, there's a strange idea abroad that in every subject, ancient books should be read only by the professionals and that the amateur should content himself with the modern books, end quote. He immediately illustrates this notion, sketching a humorous image of a poor student trying to slog through a critical commentary on Plato rather than simply picking up one of Plato's dialogues and attempting to read the actual thing. His image recalls a story to mind of my own reading of this essay during my first time through on the Incarnation. Lewis's comments proved very timely for me when, as an undergraduate laboring through a course on theology, buried under a seemingly endless reading list, I secretly longed for some rescuer to swoop in and to deliver to me a neat and cutting-edge summary of what I needed to know from these ancient theologians. It turns out, though, to my great despair, that they didn't make Cliff's notes for ancient theological treatises. <laughs> Even so, Lewis reassured me in those dire straits, quote, first-hand knowledge, he said, is not only more worth acquiring than second-hand knowledge, but is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire. Thank you, Lewis. So much for my shortcut. 
and he wasn't nearly finished with me. Every age, Lewis continued, has its own outlook. It's especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books, end quote. Reading old books helps to liberate the reader from the passions and prejudices of his or her, his or her own point in history by receiving the insights of other generations. Lewis elaborates, quote, none of us can fully escape this blindness, but we shall certainly increase it and weaken our guard against it if we read only modern books. Where they are true, they will give us truths which we half knew already. Where they are false, they will aggravate the error with which we are already dangerously ill. The only palliative is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. And this can be done only by reading old books. Not, of course, that there's any magic about the past. People were no cleverer then than they are now. They made as mis many mistakes as we, but not the same mistakes. They will not flatter us in the errors we were already committing. And their own errors, being now open and palpable, will not endanger us. Two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction, end quote. No one within a particular historical moment is entirely immune to the assumptions of their time. Not one of us is to the assumptions of our time. And so the old books provide the needed perspective for addressing the questions, particularly the heated questions of any particular era. And so we do well to look to the books of the past. They're not perfect, and so we should not idealize them. But they are consistently helpful in liberating us from the sometimes prison of our own presuppositions. At the heart of these observations is the idea that various generations of humanity ask similar sorts of questions. Because of this similarity, Lewis recognizes something like a conversation taking place between humans living throughout history, with each age making its own valiant or perhaps not so valiant attempt to answer them. The difference between an old and a new book, though, are the conscious and unconscious assumptions that work to shape a generation's answers to those questions. And even so, the conversation of the age is prone to advances and also to errors marches on. The participants that join into that conversation differ in their approach to forming ideas, and this differentiation is crucial for a person to experience if they, are, they seek to address their contemporary concerns with any degree of liberty from their own presuppositions. On the reading of old books, gives us a sense for what, that, what learning actually changes about a person. In short, reading widely and deeply works to liberate a person, works to free their intellect and imagination from the confines of their immediate moment. This does not mean the abandonment of time and place. Rather, it is of learning its heritage so as to live more fully, more presently in it. The educated person is one who enters into the great conversation first by learning and listening as intently as possible, because that's polite and good manners. And then to do, then to, after listening to what has been said thus far, by joining in. In doing so, one becomes more fully what they were designed to be and becomes integrated, not only within their own moment, but also to past and future generations. Holding fast to these ideas, we now arrive at what I think is the grandest in scale of these three works under our review. Lewis is beyond personality. Lewis in this work takes up a vision of human life as a doorway through which to consider the life of God itself. The world, Lewis begins, relates to God as a symbol or a shadow. 
Natural life in the world, what he calls bios, exists as a shadow of the supernatural life of God, which he calls zoe. The words shadow and symbol mean that things of the world, including the natural life of human beings, serve as an image of more fully real things. Earth, as it is meant to be, serves as an image of heaven. Christianity in this light communicates to us the happenings behind the world, behind this world within the symbol or shadow of the world. The symbol has an inherent connection to the real thing so that one may progress from shadow to the real. Lewis provides this mysterious image, quote, this world is a great sculptor's shop. We are the statues, and there is a rumor going round the shop that some, some of us are someday going to come to life. For any of you who have read Narnia, my wife and I are reading uh, through all, all, books, all the books right now, and uh, we just got to the scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where the white witch turns everyone to stone, whereas the breath of Aslan brings them back. That's this image that he's describing. Lewis elaborates on this image with a parallel distinction, what he calls made life and begotten life, which corresponds to his distinction of bios and zoe. This distinction arises out of reflections on the Nicene Creed, specifically on the relationship within the Holy Trinity between the Father and the Son. In keeping with the creed, he notes that the Son is begotten of the Father, while human beings are made by the Father. To this distinction, Lewis attributes this meaning. Through the Christian life, God takes human beings and makes them like the Son. This distinction is no mere theoretical matter either. God can only show himself, Lewis says, as he really is, only to real men, end quote. Becoming real is this shift from bias to zoe, from made life to begotten life. The conversion to Christian life means putting on Christ and having Christ put on us. But this may yet be a bit obscure to our minds if we're not used to wrangling with theological theory. In order to help us, Lewis brings us into a more familiar terms through what he calls good pretending. In order to do so, Lewis starts by taking up the act of prayer as an analogy. Prayer, in his case, especially the Lord's Prayer, seems at face value to be what Lewis calls, quote, a piece of outrageous cheek, unquote, because the person praying presumes being the child of God in addressing him as father. As such, the Lord's Prayer seems appropriate only to the Son of the Father, or Christ himself. Strangely, though, God not only allows for this pretending to take place, he also commands it in the gospel, saying, when you pray, pray like this. And yet the idea of prayer as pretending may seem a troubling notion to us at first. We might ask, if prayer is pretending, doesn't that make it fake? Doesn't that make it artificial or unreal? Not so, suggests Lewis. He explains two forms of pretending, bad pretending and good pretending. The bad sort occurs when pretending replaces a real thing, such as when a false thing usurps a true thing. An example is telling lies, in which falsehood takes the place of the appropriate truth. On the other hand, a good sort of pretending happens when pretending leads to a real thing. One thinks of athletic practice, in which games played in practice serve as preparation and images of the real thing, the real competition. The pretending leads to the real and prepares us for the real. Again, we see Lewis's pattern of shadow or symbol directing us to the real. Lewis suggests that good pretending is how higher things always raise up lower things. A coach training an athlete and wishing that athlete to grow must make measured and deliberate movements of pretending in order to advance that athlete's training. 
Each movement means that the coach must come to expect something of the athlete that that athlete is not yet capable of doing, so that the athlete will grow into that new capability. The expectation of growth is an act of pretending because it is not acting on the present facts or abilities of a person or a thing, but on its potential abilities. Pretending draws out the person or thing into a new way of existing. Lewis brings all of these reflections to bear on the question of personality, so central to what it means to be human. Personality has relations both in how we understand ourselves, how we understand others, and how we understand God. Lewis states clearly that we are truly persons, most fully and really ourselves, when we surrender ourselves to the persons of God and receive our personness back from him. The image, the symbol, the shadow cannot exist without the reality, and it is the reality that gives meaning to the symbol. So too, the symbol cannot progress to what is real unless it is given what is real. In Christian terms, it is through Christ that one becomes most fully a person and a human. The various other ways we see transformation take place in the world are images of this. The grandest transformation of transformation from the made life to the begotten life of the Son, to be made into the children of God, to be transformed into the children of God. After this grand transformation, meaning is given to all of those shadowy and smaller transformations that are modeled after it, that are images of it and shadows of it. We now move to see all of these ideas in harmony. Education, as we learn from our English syllabus and on the reading of old books, has as its goal the transformation of a proto-human into a true human, a full human, and a real human. Education is the drawing out of the potential of human nature. In Beyond Personality, we see a mirrored pattern at work in the Christian life, as human beings are transformed from bios to zoe, from made life to begotten life, from merely creaturely life to the life of children of God. Christianity is at its heart the making of natural humanity into the humanity of Christ. Education, then, is a mirror, an image, a shadow or a symbol of the Christian life. In this light, education finds its beginning and its end in the ultimate purpose of God's making us into members of his family. We now return from our exploration of Lewis's words, and so we turn now to spend some time considering their meaning and place in our own thoughts on what it means to educate and what it means to form human beings. And to this end, I propose these three implications of Lewis's ideas. First, education and Christianity are partners and not enemies. Second, that education is by persons, with persons, and for persons. And third, that education always engages in a genuine conversation. To our first implication, then, education and Christianity are partners and not enemies. There is sometimes the notion that matters of the mind are at odds with the matters of faith, but from Lewis's perspective, this is a false notion and a misunderstanding of both the mind and the faith. From what we've seen here today, the relationship between education and Christianity is that of icon and reality. The pattern of education in our English syllabus and on the reading of old books reflects the pattern of Christian growth in beyond personality. Education in this light is subordinate to the life of faith, but at the same time is, when functioning according to its purpose, a powerful assistant to the faith. We might even extend this point further to say that education, being a sort of microcosm of the Christian life, assists the Christian life by serving as a discipline, maybe even an ascetical discipline, that can form a person in habits that, when infused with grace, can ascend to a higher 
but not wholly different purpose. We can then see an education as a preparation for and a means of spiritual transformation within the grander framework of the Christian journey. Education, rightly construed and operating, is a means of provoking the soul to yearn for a life beyond while not replacing the made life of human beings and perhaps anticipate and long for the begotten life of Christ as the true end of the soul's growth and transformation. The second implication is that education is a process by persons, with persons, and for persons. On the surface, this may seem like an obvious statement, but I'm often surprised at how learning practices sometimes radically objectify students on whom they're exercised. There are times, it seems, when classroom teaching is discussed in what resembles more a primer on efficiency regulations in a factory than it does the cultivation of human persons. The unstated assumption behind these sorts of thoughts goes something like this. Well, if we exert the right kind of force and run kids through the proper molds, then they'll end up as an acceptable and adequate product. Put one way, we homogenize the process to create a repeatable and satisfactory outcome on a large scale. But put another way, we remake human nature in our own flawed image and one that is captive to the limitations of our time and ideas. Alternatively, Lewis reorients our idea of teachers, curriculum, and students. He starts with the assumption that persons are subjects and not objects, beings that are capable of thinking, willing, choosing, and self-reflecting. They're not merely passive objects, even in their immature forms. And to see them as objects is to attempt violence against the dignity of another person's humanity. When it comes to the classroom, this temptation finds a powerful foothold. It is so easy as a teacher or an administrator or a pastor, a parent or an employer to view a student or any subordinate as a being essentially a lower creature than myself. Compared to them, I might think, I'm smarter, more experienced, perhaps not stronger, but largely more articulate than they are. While these may all be true, the moment I take the next step to say, I am then substantially more valuable, I'm in grave peril of becoming an objectifier of others and self-deceived for myself. A better way of saying things is that perhaps I'm more advanced, but I'm on the same continuum of humanity as they are. Their journey is essentially similar to mine. And that connects us beyond our differences in competency or biography. This reorientation of my perspective, this coming to see my students as persons like me, in league with me, consequently shifts my perspective on discipline and instruction. They may at times be passive and apathetic, but that, that is now my problem and not just theirs because It interrupts the performance, not because it interrupts the performance of my job, but because my fellow human being has fallen into error. You see the difference? I'm substantially responsible for them as a neighbor and perhaps even as a brother or sister in Christ. Education is by persons and for persons. Education, though, is also with persons. Lewis suggests that education and its subordinate activities are always couched in relational terms. This means that in what we teach,